Good evening, everyone, and welcome. This time, it's my pleasure to introduce and welcome here Dr. Leah Hollis. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree from Rutgers University and her Master of Arts degree from um, University of Pittsburgh. She received her Doctorate of Education in Administration, Training, and Policy Studies from Boston University as a Martin Luther King Jr. Fellow. Also, Dr. Hollis continued her professional training at Harvard University through the Graduate School of Education, Higher Education Management Development Program. She also earned certification in project management and executive leadership at Stanford University and Cornell University, respectively. Further, she has earned certifications in EEO law, affirmative action, and conflict resolution, and investigation from the American Association for Affirmative Action. Dr. Hollis has served as a diversity trainer for Northeastern University, and she speaks regionally and nationally on such topics as race, gender, ethnicity, equality, and access. Dr. Hollis has also taught at Northeastern University, the New Jersey Institute of Technology, and Rutgers University. Her work has led her to research topics on women's experiences in leadership positions. She is author of the book, Unequal Opportunity, Fired Without Cause, Filing with the EEOC. At this time, please join me in welcoming Dr. Leah Hollis. Good evening, everybody. And I'm really very excited to be here, back in my hometown area. I know this slide is up here, and many people are thinking, gee, what is Patricia Berkeley? So let me explain that real quick before I keep going. Patricia Berkeley LLC is a diversity training and consulting group out of Greater Philadelphia. I'm the president and founder of that group, and the point to putting such a thing together is to help organizations with leadership development, uh, handling workplace discrimination issues, and also coaching managers and supervisors and leaders to create an inclusive an accessible environment. So what does that mean for you this evening? I'm having a lecture today on changing agents. As our world is changing, you will be a changing agent as you leave St. Francis and go out into the world. Innovators, leadership, and diversity management. So these are things we need to keep in mind as we're moving through, not just through our college education, but also going on into the workplace. Just a little bit more about me. I am a Richland grad, I won't give the year, but I was on the state championship volleyball team and really had a wonderful time there, so I have some local roots. I'm a graduate faculty in leadership studies at several universities, so much of what I discuss also relates to transformational leadership, servant leadership, and other leadership models that you should be aware of as you're advancing in your careers. I've been an educator and a lecturer for over 20 years, so I love speaking with folks of all ages because we are all learning all of the time. And I've been recognized as a workplace diversity expert on the Jim Bohannon Show, the Jim Blassingame Show. I've been a regular contributor to the Huffington Post, AOL Jobs, so you can Google me and find some lectures or some writings there. And also on Payscale, which is a magazine for HR professionals. Let's take a moment and reflect on our community, on the trajectory of our environment. And what I mean by that is that there's a certain context that leadership is taking these days. This has been the worst economy since FDR, where we used to mine the Benjamins. Now we are pinching pennies. So in this recession, there are several things that are changing in our environment and in our economy that are going to make things challenging for leaders. So for example, the state of our economy. If you followed the news over the summer, this is the first time in American history that we have lost our triple A-plus rating. Something about the debt ceiling, right? And as this cartoon is showing, it's as simple as, we'll just print some more money, right? We're just going to raise the debt ceiling. But what does that do for generations behind us? What does that do to our society as we keep going further and further into debt? And this is not to make some argument about the Republicans or the Democrats. It's just the state and the context of our economy. In July, unemployment was reported at 9.1%, which is two point higher than when Gerald Ford was in office. And also, this is the reported number. There are numbers in cities of LA, New York, Chicago, for some groups of people that is rising to 20%. 9.1% also is the reported unemployment rate. It is not the underemployed, and is not those who have run out of unemployment. So as you're a leader, 
from whatever position you're at. This is the context that we're working with. Foreclosures. Wow. One in 611 homes is facing foreclosure. What does this mean? Well, if you're an educator, what this means is that you don't have the tax base in your community. That means that salaries for teachers might be different. If you're a public institution, you're finding that the state might cut your funding because so many schools, so many communities do not have the money to fund their education. And as a leader, you will be recruiting people from those experiences, and you will also be working in communities that are struggling financially. What does this mean for contemporary leadership? We're asking leaders to be bigger, badder, brighter, stronger, put your cape on and leap tall buildings with a single bound. We're asking you to be magician, to be creative and agile, despite the fact that the economy is the worst that it's ever been, and despite the fact that our, our institutions are stretched out further than they ever have been. But let me tell you a story about innovation. And this is a story that hits close to home for any of you who know anything about Johnstown, Pennsylvania and the local area. When my folks first moved to this area in 1975, Bethlehem Steel was king. Bethlehem Steel from 1857 to 2003 was the largest, second largest steel producer. And, interestingly enough, Bethlehem Steel has roots to Loretto, Pennsylvania. Charles Schwab went to school here when it was St. Francis College. He attended here for two years before he went off to Pittsburgh to make his millions. So if we think about the history of Bethlehem Steel, in its heyday was making a warship a day. A warship easily as five football fields, correct? They were cranking out a warship a day in the 40s. And think about the labor and the infrastructure that's required to do that. Johnstown itself was its, re was its hub for the rails. Bought in 1923, all of the rail cars made for Bethlehem Steel were coming through our local area, which is why our community so relied on Bethlehem Steel. But it's not just about local. If you travel this great country of ours, you will find it dotted with Bethlehem Steel icons. In 1937, the Golden, State, uh, Golden Gate Bridge was built and was the largest suspension bridge of its time until the Verasanas Bridge was built sometime later. And if you ever complain about the turnpike tolls, the steel for this bridge was made in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, put out in the Atlantic Ocean, sent through the Panama Canal at a toll of $1 million in 1937, and all the way to California. Bethlehem Steel also built the Ben Franklin Bridge. George Washington Bridge is a product of Bethlehem Steel. The Chrysler Building, at its time, was the tallest building ever built, Bethlehem Steel, only to be outpaced by the Empire State Building, also a product of Bethlehem Steel. Madison Square Garden, Bethlehem Steel. Rockefeller Center, where the NBC does its broadcasting, Bethlehem Steel. You're getting the point. They were king. And in 1936, it was Bethlehem Steel that provided hydroelectric power to California, Arizona, and Nevada. And it is an amazing landmark. If you ever have a chance to see the Hoover Dam, it is just an amazing piece of architecture. Bethlehem Steel, building a warship a day, the steel for our cars, the steel for our buildings, coming up with innovative ways to deal with power. So what happened? In 1962, the past met the future. And this is a lesson to learn as future leaders and current leaders. 1962, Japanese steel beats out Bethlehem Steel for the World Trade Center project. Wait a minute. Didn't we just talk about how, the world, how Bethlehem Steel was building a warship a day? That meant Bethlehem Steel was responsible for the victory that the United States had over... Germany and Japan in World War II. Bethlehem Steel was part of a machine that literally almost annihilated Japan. So how is it that some 20 years later, Japanese steel wins one of the largest steel contracts on the globe? How does this happen? The Japanese innovated. The Japanese invested in something called mini mining, perhaps an early recycling program. They took scrap metal, they took other things that Bethlehem Steel was throwing away and created a more efficient project. 
they created cheaper steel, even with the import from Japan. Twenty years later, Bethlehem Steel saw the beginning of the end because they were outpaced by foreign innovators. Now imagine you were a leader at Bethlehem Steel. What could you have done differently? Maybe you should have hired people from different parts of the world, the Germans, the Japanese, from wherever, who are investigating these new innovations. Maybe you stop resting on your laurels. Maybe you consider ways to stay ahead of the curve, but you certainly do not want to be the helm of the largest organization that faces decline because you fail to be creative, because you fail to be innovative. So let me ask you as we're moving forward, what kind of leader do you want to be? Do you want to be the kind of leader who is at the head of Bethlehem Steel? Do you want to be the kind of leader who is creating innovation? So I'd like you to consider some qualities of leadership. You want to be transformational, perhaps. Being a change agent. There is one thing that is constant, and that is change. So as a leader, you want to know what is going on in your market. Know your data. Know the trends that are going on in your community, with your clients, in your field. And if you're thinking, oh, I'm just going to be local, I'm not going to go anywhere, legislation continues to change. Whether it's legislation about eminent domain, whether it's legislation about financial aid, whether it's new policies about the infrastructure and energy, things will change. And you should know the data. Stay informed. You want to be creative. That's what Bethlehem Steel failed to do. They kept doing the same thing year after year after year until the past caught the present. But you as a leader will learn from those lessons and learn to be creative. Generate access, meaning people of different environments, different backgrounds, different experiences. When you grant access to diverse ideas, you are putting yourself in a position have innovation. Innovation is where it's at because with less money, with struggling communities, with this recession, it is creativity and innovation that is built on the house of diverse ideas that will help you move forward as a leader. But wait a minute, there's a couple things I'd like to share with you as well. Some threats to innovation and diversity in the workplace. First of all is discrimination. And second of all is bullying. So I'm going to go over those two things as well for you to consider as you're stepping out there into the world of leadership. For the first time in American history, women are officially more than 50% of the workplace. More than 50% of the American workers are women. This information is from Casey Mulligan, a professor at the University of Chicago. We have generational diversity. Also for the first time in history, we have four generations in the workplace. We have the silent generation, those who were around during before World War II. We have the baby boomers who are hanging on, trying to not retire because the economy is so bad, they want to up their retirement. You have Generation X, those who came slightly after the baby boomers. And you have Generation Y, or the millennials. So with four different generations, you have four different ways of working with protocol and authority. You have four different ways of considering how we're going to produce and innovate. And a manager needs to pay attention to this diversity on his staff. Since 9-11, 2.9 billion veterans have gone to war in Iraq and Afghanistan in defense of our country. Also, Time Magazine says since this time, 2.3 million people, oops, I'm sorry, 2.9 million people have returned disabled. And these are young people. Prosthetic arms, closed head injuries, post-traumatic stress syndrome. The war has taken quite a chunk out of our young society. And you as an employer, as a manager, a leader, a supervisor, need to be prepared to be accommodating to the disabled. And let me also say this, not just disabled veterans, but the disabled, people who were born deaf, people who had a car accident and lost a limb, 
You don't have to be a veteran to fall into a protected class of disabled. So as leaders who are coming up with diverse ideas and innovations and creativity, you also need to prepare to accommodate, provide reasonable accommodation to those who have served and who also have earned it and deserve it. The minority majority, this is a new term. There are several states right now that the population under 15 years of age is more brown than white. These states officially are Arizona, California, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Maryland, Nevada, New Mexico, and Texas. Officially right now, in 2011, of babies across the country, there are more brown and beige babies being born than to white parents. What does this mean? By the year 2042, we will be a minority majority institution as a country, meaning that our society is going to be very mixed and beige, meaning you as a leader need to be prepared to deal with the diversity coming to your workplace. Now more than ever, the world, the laws of workforce and the understanding of Title VII policies is particularly critical. It's not just enough to say, I'm going to be a great leader and I'm going to boss my staff around and I'm going to get what I want. The days of Fred and Barney working at the quarry are not here anymore. You need to be able to work with women and minorities and folks from disabilities and different backgrounds. And the list of diversities can spill on and on from backgrounds and regions and experiences. And if you're going to be an innovative and creative leader, you're going to be able to access and manage and work with this diverse population. In 2009, the EEOC reported 36% of its complaints were based on race. 36% of the complaints were based on retaliation. And 30% were based on sex. Either women complaining they were treated differently because men treated because they weren't men, excuse me, or the other way around. Sex discrimination also applies to men. With gender discrimination, also keep in mind, with women over 50% of the workforce, this also applies to some duties that have been socially laid at the feet of women. Caregiving. We have all worked with people who they have to be out of there at fifth quarter after five because they have to go pick up their child at daycare. That's a caregiving issue. And if you discriminate against a woman because she went ahead and she's taking care of her kids, that's gender discrimination. If you're discriminating against a woman and choose a woman who doesn't have children, that's gender discrimination. If you pick on women because they're pregnant, in 1978 the rules change and pregnancy is a protected class. Caregiving also takes on another angle. Oftentimes women are left with the responsibility of dealing with their elders, whether it's somebody who is aging or, or is in the hospital or has cancer or what have you. A lot of times women are left as being the caregiver. And if you as a leader, a supervisor, a manager discriminates against somebody because they have taken on their right to care for their family, you are engaging in gender discrimination. And you can find yourself at the end of a very nasty lawsuit. Here's one that's happened in the last couple of years, the Lily Ledbetter Act. Lily Ledbetter worked for Goodyear Tire somewhere in the South. She was perfectly happy with her pay until she retired and found out the disparity in her pay compared to what the men were earning left her about, I believe, a million or two million dollars short in her retirement. She was doing the exact same job for the same amount of time. She was a woman. She filed a lawsuit. Several circuit courts awarded her millions of dollars, I believe about 3.3 million dollars. However, this case goes all the way to the Supreme Court and on a technicality was thrown out by the Chief Justice because she did not report the incident within 180 days of the initial infraction. Wait a minute. Lily Ledbetter had been working for over 20 years. I'm sure all of you, when you get a new job, you run around and you wear a t-shirt saying, I'm making X. How was she supposed to know what everybody else was making? Even though she lost the money, the first law that Barack Obama signed into law was the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act of 2009, which guarantees that women can go ahead. They're entitled not only to equal pay, but the statute has changed from 180 days of the initial infraction 
to 180 days of when she finds out. What does that mean for you as a leader? It means you better pay your people equally. If you have a man and a woman making, doing the same job, making significantly different money that is not based on performance, sure, you're going to have people who outperform others. Sure, you're going to have people who didn't get the raise because they didn't meet their objectives. But I'm talking about they're all good performers. You need to pay them equitably. And with women rising in the workforce, even though they might be in the majority, the truth of the matter is women are still primarily in entry level and middle management positions, meaning that their salaries, their structures, are still controlled by men, which leaves the power in a difficult situation for men, women at times. So as a leader, you want to pay attention to equal pay rights. Let's talk about bullying for a minute, which can be just as costly. Bullying in the workplace is on the rise. Managers need to create an inclusive environment. And bullying often happens to the different person, the person of a different religion, the person who wants to sit aside on Friday to go pray, the person who has a different holiday, the person who has a different orientation, or sometimes the person who is overweight. These trends are very similar to the bullying trends that you see in our high schools and in our elementary schools. And many states are responding, especially New Jersey, are responding with a no tolerance law. What does this mean to you as a manager, a leader, a supervisor? You cannot allow bullying to happen in your workplace for any reason. Bullying means harassing, offending, socially excluding someone negatively, affecting someone's work or tasks. It happens repeatedly. It's over a period of time and an escalating process. The person confronted ended up, ends up in an inferior position. Hmm. Bullying is very similar to harassment. Here's a definition of harassment from the EEOC. Harassment is unwelcome conduct that is based on race, color, religion, sex, including pregnancy, national origin, age over 40, disability, genetic information. Harassment becomes unlawful, enduring when it, where enduring the offensive conduct becomes a condition of continued employment. Or the conduct is pervasive enough to create a hostile work environment that even a reasonable person would say, this is hostile. Who would possibly want to work here? Harassment.